So happy Easter everybody. The hope that Jesus has given to us cannot be taken away even by the darkest of clouds and the most miserable of circumstances. Although we are separated, we are united in faith, we are united in love and we are united in hope. And as every Easter, I love that we should say together, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Let's read together from John chapter 20 and we're going to read the story of the resurrection as it's presented to us there. John chapter 20 and we're going to read through the first 18 verses. Now on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they had not understood the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood, weeping, outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. May God bless this reading of his word to us. Amen. If ever there was a time that we needed a message of hope and encouragement, it is the present. People are dying in large numbers in dramatic circumstances and as such we're not able to come together to comfort one another in the way that we would instinctively want to and long to. Therefore, the words of the Resurrection Sunday story come to us with a special relevance and poignance. There are at least four appearances of the resurrected Jesus on the first Sunday to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, to Peter, it's mentioned in Luke 24 34, though there's no details, to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, and then to the rest of the apostles, minus Thomas, on the Sunday evening in 
Jerusalem. And the Acts of the Apostles tells us that over a 40 day period, which came to a close when Jesus ascended, that Jesus appeared in many uh, ways and in different situations, in Galilee, in Jerusalem, on the Emmaus Road, and finally on the top of the Mount of Olives. The disciples remained in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament altogether there are 11 different resurrection appearances. So I want to remind you this morning that the resurrection of Jesus was testified over 40 days in different locations and it transformed those disciples. And thank God that today the resurrection is not restricted to 40 days and 11 encounters, but right around the world, the people of God are experiencing resurrection hope. One year ago today, the church in Sri Lanka experienced a terrible bombing campaign and saw dozens of its church members slaughtered as they gathered in order to worship. And today we remember that and we salute our brothers in Sri Lanka and our Tamil friends more locally, whose faith has endured such hostility and suffering and pain. And although even in Sri Lanka today they are unable to gather, as we are unable to gather, yet their hearts are gathered to Jesus and we've witnessed that they have pressed through and taken hold of the one who gives hope. So giving us an example that we must follow that we also in our time of sorrow and suffering and difficulty can lay hold of the Lord Jesus. He is the one who is alive. He is the one who is with us. He is the one who gives us hope. For us who are in the West and are well provided, it may be a good opportunity for us to give in support of those in Sri Lanka who are experiencing lockdown and poverty. And therefore, if you would like to make a gift this Easter Sunday towards them, send it into the church, mark it for Sri Lanka, and we will pass it on to Ravi, who has six churches that he is serving within the nation of Sri Lanka. And we can be partners together in the work of comforting and blessing the saints of God. Let's think of some of the changes that went on in these first disciples as a result of the resurrection. Firstly, there were emotional changes. The four appearances on the first Easter Sunday were all made to distraught disciples. Mary weeping, the apostles mourning, no hope, disconsolate. But when Jesus comes, the mood of despair changes to one of joy tells us that when they saw him in the evening, they were rejoicing. Rejoicing? I think the translation in the English Standard Version must be a little weak. It says the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. But I think that their joy was overflowing, unbounded. Perhaps it was a shock. Perhaps they hadn't fully realised that Jesus was alive, despite the report that had come from Mary. But their feelings surged and soared as they recognised Jesus is alive. Secondly, there were mental changes. There was much that they had to understand that they previously failed to understand. Consistently, we're always pointing this out, they didn't understand that Jesus would suffer. He told them, told them again and told them again, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and die. Well, now they come to terms with that. But the resurrection, they couldn't possibly conceive. Dead men stay dead. Resurrections don't happen. They didn't happen then, and generally speaking, they don't happen now. This event was totally different. And although we have a few instances in the Old Testament, they really are very few and far between. But now... Their minds are changed. The scriptures are opened and Jesus spends time with them, speaking to them, opening up the scriptures, the things concerning his suffering, his glory that he also would enter in. Their minds were changed. And thirdly, their outlook was changed. 
By the time the 40 days were over and Jesus had ascended, the, the disciples were prepared for world mission. Remain in Jerusalem till the Spirit comes on you and then you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and the ends of the earth. The focus was going to move from Jesus' little group gathered in Jerusalem to going to the ends of the earth. They were truly going to be an apostolic band, a group of sent ones who were going to transform the whole of the Roman world, the whole of the, the world, the whole of their time, the whole of history ever since as the gospel has rolled out from that epicentre and continues to roll out. So there's a change of outlook. And Mary's story gives us great insight into the spiritual changes that they underwent. Mary was a Galilean girl with a troubled past. She was from Magdala, a little fishing village near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. We don't know much about her, just in Luke 8 it tells us that Jesus had delivered her from a number of demons and that she had devoted herself to supporting and travelling with Jesus. But there's something special about Mary. Now I know there's a lot of nonsense that's said about some kind of relationship that Jesus had with Mary. Did they have some kind of romantic association? There's nothing of that in the Bible. That's just a load of speculative nonsense. But what we do find is that Mary makes her appearance at the cross and at the tomb. And these little mentions are all that we know about her. Her devotion to Jesus was absolute. Here's a quote from Alexander White. Did you ever try to put yourself into Jesus' mother's heart on the day of the crucifixion or into Mary Magdalene's heart? They stood and wept as never another wept in this world till John at Jesus' command took his mother away from Calvary and led her to the city. But Mary Magdalene still stood by the cross. He dismissed his mother, but he kept Mary. She would not be dismissed. When he bowed his head, she saw him do it. She heard him say, it is finished. It was not the place for a woman. But Mary was not a woman. She was an angel. She was the angel who strengthened him. She was the whole church of God and the ransom bride of Christ at that moment in herself. She and her twin brother, the thief on the cross. Now he's speaking poetically. The thief on the cross was completely unrelated to Mary Magdalene. But they shared this faith. They both saw and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he hung there on the cross. She was last at the cross but she was first at the tomb. She comes there with her broken dreams. It's hard to imagine what Mary was feeling as she made her way to that tomb on the first Easter Sunday. She'd seen her Lord crucified, the one who had transformed her life and had become the focus of her devotion and her dreams had been unexpectedly and terribly murdered before her very eyes. Mary had seen Jesus heal the sick. She knew Jesus was genuine. She'd received from him from his own ministry. She'd been moving from place to place and she'd seen and heard the things that Jesus said and saw the things that Jesus had done and she had opportunity to talk with him personally they were on first name terms mary believed him believed her teaching but her expectations had been brought to the ground in disaster like the disciples she wasn't able to understand or grasp the thought that jesus could die in such a violent and humiliating manner, let alone that this was the plan of God and the ultimate reason for his coming into the world. She comes with broken dreams, and yet she comes with sustained devotion. This woman, overwhelmed by grief, yet she could not keep away from the place where Jesus had been buried. She comes there 
The tomb was guarded. The stone covered the entrance. Yet Mary comes to the tomb. And the first appearance of the resurrection was about to take place. Not to Peter, not to James, not even to John, the beloved disciples. Not to Mary, the mother. But to Mary Magdalene, the liberated demoniac. She's the one who was privileged first to see the risen Lord Jesus. Why didn't Jesus appear to them all at once? Last at the cross, first at the tomb, God rewards her faith. Not that Mary was looking for a reward, she was looking for Jesus, the one that she loved. But when she got there, the stone is gone, the tomb is empty, the body is gone, the soldiers are gone. She's confused. She doesn't know what's gone on. She's perplexed. What was going on? And where were the men? She goes and finds Peter and John. They come. John, perhaps being younger, arrives at the tomb and looks in. Peter arrives a little later and rushes straight in. But Jesus isn't there. The grave clothes, folded, cause them to believe this isn't the work of grave robbers. This is the work of angels. The body is gone. Something has happened. Faith begins to rise. They see and they believe. New Testament faith is believing without seeing. And that's what the apostles did. They believed although they did not see. And then they went home. But Mary would not go home. Mary remains at the tomb. And then she sees suddenly angels. Tells us in verse 12, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at his head, one at the feet. Where were the angels when Peter and John were there? They must have just appeared as her back was turned. And she says, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. She turned around and there is Jesus. But she doesn't recognise him. It's such a lovely touch, isn't it, that Jesus, she, th she thought he was the gardener. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, If you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. How is she going to take him away? How is this woman going to carry the body of Jesus away? But this is a heart of love that's speaking. Have you ever wondered why Jesus, who could appear in a room at will, delegated to Mary the task of informing the disciples about the resurrection, they must receive a message and become models of our faith, believing without seeing. And she becomes the apostle to the apostles, the first witness to the resurrection, the one who sets this testimony into play around the Jerusalem community and then into all the world. Praise God for her testimony. Praise God for the apostles who believe and later who see. Sometimes we fail to see Jesus because of our grief. Sometimes we fail to recognise, even though he is, is speaking to us. But like Mary, let's be those who both believe and see and then testify to others. I have seen the Lord. There's three things that we can draw from the words that Jesus gives to Mary. First of all, in verse 17, go tell my brothers. Jesus doesn't consider the disciples to be failures, although they did fail him and they did forsake him. But he is not negative towards them. He considers them his brothers. Every true believer at some time may fail the Lord. But he does not accuse or judge, rather he remains faithful and forgiving and welcomes us back as brothers. 
Hallelujah. Just like the prodigal is received by the Father, so we, when we fall short of God's glory and confess our sins, are welcomed in again. Secondly, he says, my God and your God. His God is our God. These are some of the simplest and yet the most reassuring words that anyone can hear. Some know God is God, but they can't call him my God. In a, they can only speak that in a general sense. He's the God of all creation. But what Jesus is referring to here is more than that. The Bible makes this personal knowledge of God a mark of the covenant. Salvation and great joy. He is our Father. He is our God. And the third thing is there. He is our Father. Jesus enjoyed a special relationship with the Father like no one else. He was with the Father from all eternity. And now we may rightly come to God and call him our Father who is in heaven. Our loving Heavenly Father. The same love that he has for Jesus, he has for us. Jesus says, the Father himself loves you. Let's take comfort and assurance. We're his brothers and sisters. He is our God. He is our Father. This Easter, let's take these words for ourselves. God is our God. He is our Father. And he has called us. He has loved us. He has commissioned us. We are a people of hope. We are a people of hope with a light that shines in the dark moments. We are a people who will overcome. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And he who is the resurrection and the life will pour that life into our hearts this Easter.